so well, thank you all for being here today in this very last session of the conferences. It's Saturday, so we are really glad that you made it. Uh, so well, the paper I'm presenting today is a co-authored paper with Rachel. As the title clearly points out, we are looking at ethnic inequalities and the educational and labor market outcomes in Guatemala. Um, let's move quickly to the objective of the paper. So basically what we want is to understand horizontal inequalities, but also indigenous politics in the country. Why do we think that Guatemala is important case to illustrate these two phenomena? Well, first, um, we have two main reasons. First, uh, Guatemala has the second largest indigenous population by percentage in Latin America, and a very well-documented history of horizontal inequality and violent state-sponsored oppression. So we'll go through it uh, later on. The second reason is that um, comparing to other Latin American countries, notably with Bolivia, what we find is that there is a weakness of the indigenous political mobilization at the national level in the country. So basically what we're saying is, uh, if you take the case of Bolivia and the case of Guatemala, both of them with a high share of indigenous population, you, and if you look at the a political sphere, you will realize that on one hand, Bolivia, with 60% of indigenous populations since 2005 or six, if I'm not mistaken, has elected an indigenous person as president of the country. And the indigenous movement also has a, a relative good presence at the Congress level. However, if you take the case of Guatemala with 40, between 40 and 60%, depending on the source you're looking at, of indigenous population, we'll realize that they haven't had an indigenous president, but also at the Congress level, they, do, they have a very low, very weak political representation. So basically the point that we're trying to make here at the argument of the paper is that um, you see the economic literature heavily relies on the indigenous, non-indigenous divide when looking at inequalities. So basically we create the indigenous group if it, if, if it were just one, a, very, a one homogeneous group. On the other hand, you have the anthropological or more political science literature that points out to a huge diversity or huge heterogeneity within the indigenous population and take this argument to say that is this fragmentation within the, uh, the indigenous um, group of the country that explain to a certain extent this weak political uh, indigenous mobilization in the country. So w the argument we're trying to advance here is that it's of course this cultural difference within the indigenous population, but also the socioeconomic difference within the indigenous population that explain, may explain this weak political indigenous mobilization. So um, let me give you some context for the for the country itself. So Guatemala, it's a, it's a small country in, in Central America. It's home of some 50 million people. As I have said before, 40%, between 40 and 60% of the population, that depends pretty much on the sources you are looking at, it's, has self-identified as indigenous. Um, within this indigenous population, we find 21 language ethnic groups, uh, most of them Maya descent, but however, different ethno-linguistic groups. Right. Um, in terms of socioeconomic inequality, this has been well documented in previous work between the indigenous and non-indigenous divide. Where you will find that indigenous people are the poorest of the country. They are mainly rural and they are fine in elementary occupations and in the agricultural sector, mostly. When looking at the, at the um, more political sphere or the political representation in the country, we are, we're going to take the case of the 2011 elections because that's the year we're using for the analysis. But what, what we find is that out of the 158 seats available at the Congress, only 22 were won by the indigenous leaders. This roughly speaking is around 14% of the seats available for a country where half of the population is indigenous. Right? Um, so, there's a, a last point that I wanted to make here is that historically the indigenous population in Guatemala has uh, been marginalized and um, well all over the periods right since the colonial periods they have served as basically a very um, cheap hand labor for the government then with the state with the, with the independence and with the coming of the liberal state they also were forced to work or serve as uh, were cheap hand labor in the coffee plantations 
right? And uh, what an, an, impor an important point during the history in Guatemala is that uh, there was a civil war that lasted 36 years. It started in the 60s and ended up in, the, in 1996 with the signing of the peace agreement. What is important about it is that the moment the war was over and we start counting out the, the victims of this war, we realized that 83% of the victims of the war were Maya, were indigenous. So during this uh, war period, there were uh, discriminatory massacres against the Maya population sponsored by the government. Um, so that is that serve as a as a context for the for the country itself and what what we want to show here it's basically the socioeconomic differences uh, within the indigenous population so we're going to split the sample in two basically we work with um, uh, uh, two years 2000 and 2011 and here what you see is the uh, is the educational outcomes of the different uh, ethnic uh, children groups uh, ethnic groups of children in the country, right? So the Ladino that you see here, here, so the Ladino, so the first column basically, let, let's focus on, on, on primary complete. So this is basically an indicator variable telling us whether the child has finished primary school by the age of 15 years, has successfully completed primary school. And when we see that the Ladino, which is the majority group at, uh, let's see, 2011, 70, 4% of them has successfully completed primary school. If we take the indigenous group as a, as, as a whole, we see that the average is 63. However, what is interesting for us is to see that when we study each of these groups separately, you, we find a um, huge difference among them, right? So for instance, the Kechi children, they have been, uh, they, they, they are worse off than the others, right? So just 50% of them have complete primary education by the age of 15. And there is a huge difference, of course, with the Kachikel children, 73% have already complete primary education by the age of 15. So these two are quite similar between the Ladino and the Kachikel. The Kachikel is doing much better than the other indigenous groups in the country, right? So again, what, what we want to point out here is that there exists important socioeconomic difference within the indigenous populations that haven't, uh, haven't been taken into account in the economic literature so far. Uh, when we look at the earnings, so for us, labor market uh, uh, outcomes will rely on earnings on the earnings distributions of the different groups. And what we see here is that, so this is for 2000, this is for 2011. So the red line is the earnings distribution of the Ladino, the majority group of the population. The solid black line is the distribution if we take the indigenous group as one, and all the others represent the main four biggest uh, ethnic groups in the country, right? So of course, there is a trend towards greater equality in education as well and labor market outcomes. So the distribution here is more centered at the mean. It's less dispersed, of course. However, we see that the indigenous population together as a whole or separately, but each ethnic group is, is always, sorry, it's always um, falling behind the Latino population, right? So uh, this was for just to show some, some statistical differences between the, the groups. So now, uh, what are we actually doing on the, on the paper? It's quite simple. So we're going to work with two household representative um, surveys. So we work with the, um, the household surveys of 2000 and 2011. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at, at three different ed educational outcomes, human capital outcomes. So these ones are exactly the same that we saw in the previous slide. So we care about whether the child is enrolled in the school, and, but is also attending the school or was attending the school at the time of the survey. Where that will be the first outcome. The second outcome will be whether the child has entered a school, the formal school system at the official age. Official entry age in Guatemala is seven years old. So it will be one if you have entered before or until, well, for some measurement error to eight years old, let's say, and zero otherwise, right? So this is about late entrance. And then we look at the school competition. So basically here we want to know if children aged 15 years old by the age of 15, they have successfully completed primary school or not. So the, the models are pretty straightforward, pretty standard. So we use profit models. These all are indicator variables. And then for the um, labor market outcomes, what we're doing, uh, we focus again on earnings differentials. So we're going to see the different dis earnings distributions of, the, of each of the indigenous groups at the mean. So we use Oaxaca decomposition. And then we also want to know whether there are some differences um, 
across the uh, the whole earnings distribution. So I quickly move to the to the results. So here for educational outcomes. So first panel is the, the, the data for 2000, 2011. All of these three are the um, outcome variables. And here what we're showing is simply the effect of the variable of interest. The variable of interest is a dummy variable equal to one if the child is an indigenous, zero if it's Ladino. Again, for the Kiche here or any of the others is equal to one if the child is a Kiche, zero if it's Ladino. So it's always with reference to the um, majority group, to the Ladino children, right? So for instance, obviously two, two, two important things to notice between 2000 and 2011, all these significant differences have already mostly disappeared. However, what we care about is here. So let's, let's look at the school attendance, the school enrollments. So if we take the indigenous group, if it were just one group, one homogeneous group, we see that there are not significant differences between Ladino children and indigenous children. These differences have disappeared. However, if we do it disaggregated, although this is true for most of the other groups, we still see that the Kachikel children are still 4% less likely to be enrolled in the school in 2011. So if we do this for all the other uh, outcome variables, let's focus on primary completed, we see that at the mean, the indigenous group together, they are still 4% less likely to have completed primary school. However, if we split it, we have cases like the mom children who are 8% less likely to have completed primary school. So it's double the, the, the mean. And then you have the case of the Kachikel, for instance, who, is, who has traditionally traditionally been doing better than all the other ethnic groups in the country, right? So once again, this, this difference here, although it seems small, they are very important for public policy analysis, because if you take it just, if it were just one group, then you are missing all these nuances between the, uh, uh, among the different groups. So uh, very quickly, the, the results for the earnings distribution. So I'm presenting only the Oaxaca decomposition, so this is the difference in the gap the earnings gap at the mean. We have done it for the whole quantile theme, but the results are more, more or less the same. And for the point that we want to make here is, first we see, so this is in Quetzals and it's in the log. So let's don't focus on the magnitude, let's just focus on the fact that there is a positive gap, right? For all the groups, the indigenous groups, compared with the Ladino, and uh, also, of course, trend towards greater equality. The gap has been reduced between 2000 and 2011. And what is important here is the part of explain and unexplained part of the gap. So the explain part of the gap is basically what is due to the difference in endowments between the different uh, population. It's always the one indigenous group versus the Ladino groups, right? And then what we see is about the unexplained part. The unexplained part is what is usually attributed to discrimination in the labor market, right? So what we see is, of course, that again, if we take the indigenous group, there are huge differences within the group itself, right? So let's take the case of the Kachikel, where the unexplained part of the gap is more than half of the gap itself, right? It's more than 50% of the gap. So somehow there is some kind of labor market discrimination for this specific group, the Kachikel. When we look at the man, however, we see that the entire gap is already explained by difference in endowments. And this, again, is a huge it's very important for public policy analysis, right? So basically, these are the results that we have. The point that we wanted to make is first, the indigenous, non-indigenous divide that is highly found in economic literature obscures meaningful diversity within the indigenous population. And second one, we have shown that there's so uh, important socioeconomic difference within the population this fact together with the cultural difference and ethno-linguistic difference that have already been pointed out in the more political science and anthropological literature, these facts together may, expl may explain the weakness of the indigenous mobilization in the country. Good, but that's all. Thank you. <laughs>